Hi, everybody. Everyone, apologies for the slight delay. We had some technical difficulties, so we got there in the end. Um, so we, we'll get straight into it. So as you see from the title and the thumbnail, today's session is about faster kicks. So uh, with the slight delay, we get into it straight away, okay? So we'll start off with a bit of a filthy warm-up and get us going. So we'll go in. Cheerio. Can you? Take one. Okay, so let's get a body moving and we'll go from there. So start off, everybody, so we go into like a squat position and we just get nice and deep into the squat, loosen up the hips a little. And from here, we'll go one, two, three, and then we'll straighten up onto the hamstrings. One, two, three, sit back into it. Just get the hips loose. One, chest up nice and high, two, three, and we'll open up into the hamstrings. One, two, three, and then back up again. One, two, three. From here, I want you to reach to the roof. Get the chest nice and high, rotate the opposite side, look up as you go, making sure that your heels are completely flat here, so we don't want our feet to creep up onto the tippy toes, and just reaching. Okay, so from here I want you to go a little bit wider with your squat, try to get your feet as directly forward as best you can, and we'll just dig the knuckles into the mat and pull the hips down and forwards. So up nice and high with the chest. I just move side to side with this one a little bit. So you don't want to be in like a hinge position so much. You want to be almost like in a squat. So don't try to have your butt facing behind you too much. Have it facing the ground. Just move on side to side. So let me just adjust the camera here a little bit. Hopefully that's all right. And we'll sit into this one. So. What we want to do here is just get like a half a squat, a half straight leg, and just going side to side. Stay low as you transition the weight. Try not to be on your tippy toes of the bent leg, and stay low as you transition to the opposite side. And again, keep that chest up. You get your butt as close as you can to the floor. Pull that chest up high, and we'll be warming up the body then as we're getting loose as well. So win win. Good. And what we want to do next there, everybody, is we're going to go to like, um, what's called like a spider mat. So I'll do this at a bit of an angle. So we'll have both hands at the front, stretch the feet back a little bit, bring one hand to the front and up. So you get a stretch here, lift the chest, one, two, three, feet back and stretch the other side. We have some people here in the comments, welcome everybody. Nice and hold the chest, join the feet together at the back. Opposite leg up again, raise the chest. You feel a nice stretch on this one. This is a nice one, especially if you're sitting down a lot, whether it's COVID and lockdown and you're doing a bit extra sitting or whether you're in the office all day on the computer or whatever. This is a nice one to just open out the body, get us going. All right, just shake out the legs a little bit. Nice. So, what we want to do from here is just get the legs going again. So we put one leg at the front. The most important thing about this is we're not kicking from the rear leg. Okay, so from the front leg, you just lift, drop, and kick. Aim on a target somewhere in the room, and just aim to go higher and higher with each one. Dropping to the floor every time. Just lose the number. And change leg. So we arm it the other side. Good. And relax. Super. So we get moving from there. So right here I have a agility ladder. So we'll just get some steps going on this. So we'll start off very simple. I'll adjust the camera now in one sec. Okay. So what we want to do here, everybody, is get the legs moving a little bit and just get us prepared for what Adrian has next with our plyos. Hopefully that camera stays. All right. So what we're going to do here, everybody, is very simply just open and close the feet as we go through. Open, close, open, close. You see how that works? I'm just filling it up. So whatever space you have at home, just go forward and back a little bit like this. Stay on the bottom of the feet. Just get the body here to what's next, getting us a little bit more active. And relax. So next what we'll do is we just go on one leg. 
tapping forward all the way through, maybe if you have the space of five or six steps forward and back, and switch. We do the same one laterally. So pick up one leg, this is a good one for a side kick and things like that. So one up and just cross, transition off the way, and switch. Switch. And that will get us moving nicely. Okay, so what we want to do now is if you can kind of pick a line on the ground and go in and out of that line. So in and out on one foot. That's a bit trickier going back, take the time if you need to. And switch. Close. And there's an important principle that comes along with this as well, everybody. It's like if you're not comfortable with it, it's something, a movement pattern. For example, we don't want to exert too much speed or force in it too soon. So it's very important that we we'll see that throughout today as we do the today's session. All of the stuff that you want to do in a dynamic and explosive fashion is something that you want to be comfortable with the movement already. So we we'll pass it over to Adrian and we'll start with some titles. Cool. So folks, the, the first thing we'd say when it comes to these plyos is these are quite basic plyos. You take them within your own capacity. So the height that you leave off the ground, the amount of contact time on the floor will vary depending on your capacity and where your strength is at. But we just want to introduce the principles of them so we can start building. First thing we're going to talk about when it comes to more fast kicks or more speedy kicks is that the underlying mechanics have to be good. So in other words, you have to be strong enough to be fast. Your body composition has to be right to be fast. And the mechanics of the kicking technique have to be right to be fast. And then we can go into technical tactical as well. But let's start with a few pogos. All a pogo is, we're going to be jumping on the spot. We're using our hands to assist the movement. And we are not trying to bend the knees. So this way. And what I'd like you to do is do sets of 10. We're going to do three sets of 10 of the pogos and two sets of 10 of the majority of the rests of the exercises. We want to rest for probably two to three times as long as what we're working. So this isn't really warm up. This is physical preparation. And the goal here is to be explosive and not to completely tire the nervous system. So let's see what we've got. Another set of 10. Bring the arms into it. Stiff knees. And rest again. So if it takes you six or seven seconds to do the 10 of those, we then want to rest for 14 to 20 seconds before we go into another one. And if you're doing this in your gym, you might go up along the floor or you do them on the spot and take a walk in between, come back and go again. Okay, and we're taking again a little bit of a rest. For our next one, we're gonna look at squat jumps. So for these, we're gonna plant the feet just about shoulder width. We're gonna have a softening of the knees and hips. So we have a counter movement jump. And so the goal here is we're gonna do sets of eight, just two. So let's give that a try, see how we go. So we have our squat, this position, and a set of eight. Resting, resting, resting. We'll go again in just a moment. This time with some lateral hiders, they're called, or heightens. And the goal here is to move from one foot to the other foot. You don't have to go super far to the side, but we're gonna build this first set up so that you're gonna land in balance, land in balance, and we're working on balance first. And then we're going to explosively change from side to side. So first set, balance, 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 balance. Okay, a little rest, and now we do the explosive ones. So we're looking to land and bounce. From here, We get the idea. So it should be not a huge distance side to side, but it is lateral. And that's really important because we won't be just going forwards and backwards with our kicking. We will be including much more broad movement types. So next one, uh, split squat jumps. So our goal here, 
make like a walking stance. We're going to be going knee towards the floor. So dropping a little into the movement, bring the hands with you and we're going to power up. And each time we land back in this position. So I'll swap legs for a second. So what we're looking for is here. And rest. When you're working for pure speed, rest is going to be very important. Sometimes we'll only have a single or a small number of efforts and then rest. Let's go on the other side, same thing. So the knee and the hip are going to go straight towards the floor and we're going to explode upwards, bringing the hands into it. Another set of eight. And most of the work is done here with the front leg. The back leg is really for balance with those ones. Next one, we're going to do some skips. So the goal is to land with both feet together, lift one knee, both feet together, lift the other knee. We'll travel slowly forward as we go and very fast exchanges of the feet. So first ones, fast and low, like this. And the goal is just to have the hands working in opposition. And we want the two feet together on the ground for the shortest possible time. One more set like that, just hitting and exploding each side. Okay, I probably leaned a bit forward. I'm watching the camera down there, bad idea. We can stay quite tall on these ones. It doesn't matter massively, but we'd like to keep the posture wherever possible, especially now as we move into the next one, which is the same exercise, but we are looking for height. For this one, I don't need you to move much forward, but allow yourself a little bit of space to drift forwards. Now we are looking for height. Definitely rest. The more explosive the movement, the longer we need to rest, to fully recover between the exercises. And again, remember this is physical preparation, not conditioning. We're looking to make sure that we're increasing the explosiveness of the joint, of the muscle. Okay, so here we go. One more time, nice and high. Two feet together, every time you bounce, bring the hands with you. And done. Okay, so that will do us in terms of our plyos. And we might jump back to Richie to have a look at adding resistance to some of your kicking exercises in order to overcome that initial resistance and build some speed and power. Okay, everybody. So what we're gonna focus on next is just setting ourselves up a little bit with um, that initial resistance to just overload the system a little bit. Okay, so the, the idea here is to kind of almost give us a, a, a drag back that we, we have to overcome to really help us with that force production. So a lot of time with, with this stuff that we talk about, guys, it's, it's almost a mentality as well of, of getting that speed. You need to come, come at it with, with that mentality if you're looking to exert force with it. Okay, so let's have a look through some of the techniques. And um, so I'm just going to set up here with the, with the bag. So the first one that I'm going to work off is a reverse lunge in the opposite direction. So I'm just going to set up in a lunge position. Uh, I don't know Adrian, if you're able to adjust my camera on your side. Let's see. Uh, not entirely, not from there. That's okay. Like that. Yeah. No problem. Okay, so from there, guys, in this lunge position, what we're looking to do is just push off this front leg here. Okay, so what I want to do is come up off this leg and drive off this side. Okay, so we want to just go through a few of these. Okay, making sure if you're not comfortable with this position, definitely start much closer. So we're looking to come from this position, drive off the side leg up. Reset, you're going to go over the shoulder, push, and down. We're really pushing off the standing leg here. Lift. All right, and we're recovered, as we said. After these ones, it's like a 100 meter sprint. You would expect you. Same ball to go and do another once he's finished it. Yeah, it's a full of effort when we're trying to look for that force production. So just recover for a few seconds. And of course, this one can be adjusted as well. 
from multiple gates. So once you get this, you can go from here. It can be Dolio Chaggy, it can be Doro Chaggy. You have the options. Okay? So that's the reverse lunge. You're basically setting up the drifting line here in the opposite direction completely. Okay, so a lot of times you see people here, and the option will come out from this angle as well. Up and one. So there's lots of ways we can adjust the feet for this. I'm just gonna try to get a bit more of an angle for everybody here, guys. Hopefully that works a little bit better. Fingers up from here, we have this one. So what we can do then from here is we can also bring it up into our various kicks that we're talking about. So we have this option in as well. So we can come at it from the side again, pushing off this standing leg. So you're driving all your force into this leg and then that shoots and it attacks, okay? So really driving the force off the standing leg. This is our focus here, okay? So we're driving everything we have into this. Okay, so drive and push. All right, so let's do a few of these. Okay, so then I know that we're really focusing today on kicking and how to get better and faster, more explosive kicks, but of course we can take the same approach. And by or blitz, official position in a front lunge here, and then you can drive this time as the opposite position. So we're not driving from the far off leg, we're driving from the front leg. So from here, you just get set up where you feel it's nice and comfortable and drive to the target. Okay, so you want to take off the analogy I use here. Everybody is like an aeroplane taking off. So as you increase the height, you go forward as well, not really like a helicopter where you're going directly up. So make sure you're up and forward together. Up and through. Reset. If you're more comfortable with it, adjust the distance. Really get that speed. And we're just like this. All right? So then once you get more comfortable with those techniques, we can have a look at another option where we have our squat lunge. So um, you can see me in one second, don't worry. So I'll just turn my standing foot like a Cossack. We did this and you push through that with your side leg. So we're just overloading our standing leg a little bit. Now this one, you need to really take it handy. Okay, let me sneak into the camera here. Yeah, so from here we want to drift down, 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 one leg on the squat, get comfortable, and attack forward. Now here is the kicker. I think that's important on this. Okay, when, if you're, if you take, Adrian's going to touch on this later on the, the stretch shortening cycle. If it takes you a long time to overload that muscle, you're, you're wasting energy. Okay, so we don't, if it takes you a long time to get into that squat, you're not ready for this exercise. It needs to be something where you can quickly transition the weight. Okay, that's why it's very important that this is something that you're familiar with the technique and the resistance is quite light. If it's a big, heavy resistance, then you're not going to be able to do it explosively. And you're going to be loading up that position and do maximum force coming forward and that's not what we're looking for it's just an extra little bit of resistance to, to help us a little bit and a lot of people look as well at the resistance bands we can do this unfortunately right now i don't have any way to hold it for me uh, with, with lockdown but we can use them but one of the most important things we need to be aware of is there needs to be um, a little bit of tension on it at, not at your end range so if a simple example of a punch, you don't want the tension to be there at the end point. You want it to be there at the start of the movement. This is where you're looking for that force production, where you're trying to ex exert your force um, and really become more explosive. So make sure if you are doing any like, type of training, you, you kind of look it up, you know what you're doing a little bit. You don't just see something on YouTube say, okay, that's cool, let's apply that to my training and I'm gonna do it too. Okay, you really need to be comfortable with the techniques and know what you're doing there. Because especially for the younger guys, you're going to have some injuries if you, if you don't know what you're doing with this stuff. I'm just doing it for a good segue to talk about that uh, stretch shortening cycle a little bit as well. And just sure. that whole idea of maybe not 
over extending and holding that big position um, where you have to come out with, with a big exertion. So we, we want it to be nice and snappy, okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's have a think about that. So one of the first things that we're really dealing with here with the stretch shortening cycle is, well, the what is it? What are we trying to do with it? How are we going to use this to help us? So the idea is that any time I load a muscle, so maybe I just jump or bounce, that force that you build up that uh, by dropping, okay, is stored to some degree. Some of it dissipates, some of it is stored within the structures in the body. So the ligaments, the tendons, and the muscular units themselves, okay? And in rebounding out of that, we can kind of piggyback off of the muscle, the energy that we've stored up. And if we do quite a bit of training with this, we can do that more efficiently. So everybody can do it to some degree. So, for example, is a simple idea here. If I was going to sidestep and I go here, the fact that I push into my right leg here is letting me rebound and better send my weight over there. And it'll be better than if I just did a little bit of a, a, a shuffle off to the side. It'll be more explosive. Never mind the fact that we're also sending, have the body movement with it as well. How we're going to use that with training our kicks is we're going to start working on some depth jumps in particular. And that's generic, so dropping off of something and taking a bounce, and I'll show you those. And then we're going to use the same philosophy to allow us to execute some really simple kicks. It could also be used for a blitz, but we're using it for some really simple kicks to try to in, involve that stretch shortening cycle, add some energy, store it up, and very quickly release it, uh, almost like a springboard, the idea of a springboard. We're going to very quickly release it, and it also kind of helps us in the idea of overspeed training. So we're really trying to uh, build that rebound, uh, and make the muscle contractions faster, develop our force faster and earlier in the movement so that we have more time to, I suppose, accelerate and finish the movement. Uh, very short and rough explanation. But let's start with a small uh, block here. So this could be built all the way up to a plyometric box, you know, quite a big box, but this is enough to illustrate the principle. So what I'm gonna do is step off the box. The second my feet hit the floor, I'm gonna do a tuck jump. And so the goal each time, rest fully in between, so I'm not looking to do fast sets, but I want to be a rubber ball when I hit the floor, okay? So when I touch, I want to bounce off that floor, okay? If you're on a hard surface, wear training shoes, and I mean like proper trainers with a bit of absorption, I'm on mats here, so it's not too bad, but we do need to have a little bit of uh, cushioning. It will really help. Okay, so each time I'm going to do just two more. Focus on bouncing, that feeling of rubber ball springiness, okay? It'll also help you to organize your body because if you land in a bad position, I'll try and do one where my chest is forward. It will very quickly teach you that you're in a bad position because all that force will apply itself through uh, basically like a, a loose wobbly system. We want to have tension in the right places so that we can use that force efficiently. Now I'm going to use the exact same idea here, and we can lend that to getting us into some kicks. Okay, so if you don't have one of these, you don't have to use it. We can have, for example, the exact same idea. Let's say I do a front kick. Okay, I can have a jump, and then I can add the front kick. So I'm trying to use the, the acceleration from the landing to drive the kick. I'm gonna illustrate this with turning kick first, okay? So, I'll be kicking over onto this side. I'm looking for a little bit of a drop, and away. So each time I hit the floor, I'm gonna just try and accelerate directly into the target, and I also wanna focus on the pull away at the end. So don't kick through the target, look to kick and get to the floor, so that there's no you're not putting the brakes on anywhere in the movement, okay? So very importantly, if I kick the air, I have to be a little careful, slow the movement down at the end to protect my knee. When I'm hitting a target, even if it's a light one like a flipper, I can kick through, and by not putting the brakes on, it allows me to go a little bit faster, okay? And that's something that we want to use. Again, in terms of your training of these, you can do them in sets of maybe six to 12, as long as you have a nice recovery in between each one, and then you rest after a set until you feel fresh again, okay? And that's weird for us in Taekwondo. We don't do that very often. 
But when you're training pure speed, we need to be refreshed. We need to have the energy back in the system so that we can go and be explosive. Once again. And we just want to be fast. So taking this away, I can do a similar kind of idea using our lateral hops, okay, those height and hops that we had earlier. So I'm starting here, fix Bob. Uh, I'm starting here with my weight on my left leg. I'm going to be transitioning over onto my right leg and very quickly kicking with my right leg as well. So from here, I'm back down. So the exact same thing here, I have my weight on my right. I'm going to go to the left and away once again. And once again, and all we're looking to do by transitioning it onto one leg is I'm doubling the amount of force I'm putting into that leg, loosely speaking, okay? So because I'm not landing on the two feet together, I'm putting all of my body weight plus that acceleration due to gravity into the one leg. And then I have to overcome that resistance and go. I'm benefiting from the stretch shortening cycle. I can be kind of explosive when I do that. So one other little thing that we can do is look to drop into a stance and then go. So like we did off of this, but we can set it up with a few different uh, kind of footwork steps. So we make this very Taekwondo specific. So for example, if I start here and I just jump changing legs, I have the same kind of movement because I'm loading with this jump. Now it's an exaggerated jump, but I'm loading the muscles with the jump and then explosively firing. So from here and away. The same thing could happen with, for example, a back kick or you know something like that but I can do it with forward to backward loading as well. So I can go from here and make sure I'm quite quick coming away. So I have my jump or my shift. And what that's allowing me to do is to load in one direction and unload in the other direction by going forwards and backwards. So we've had kind of side to side, directly up and down, forwards to backwards. And we can use all of those and make them very, very specific to our Taekwondo uh, to help us with uh, with loading the right way so that we can benefit from that sh stretch shortening cycle. So the kicks that this kind of lends itself to would be likes of the turning kick. Downward kick in particular can be quite nice. So where we use the drop and lift. So we had, for example, over the last couple of days, the turning kick and into the downward kick where we can use that drop and lift as well. But it doesn't work very, very well for side kick. It's Overcoming the resistance from the beginning of the movement is nicer with the side kick. And it's simply because of the way the kick carries, okay? The end point is in the air. So it's a, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to have one up here. So we can still use it, but I prefer for those kind of jump and drop type of uh, exercises to use the turning kick, the downward kick, the back kick, uh, front kick even. But for the side kick, I quite like the exercises where there's a little bit of band resistance or where you're using the exercises where you're coming up from the knee or overcoming your resistance on a standing leg, going to half squat and push. And they really help to develop the kind of movement we need in the side kick. So, Richie, do you want to add a few extras? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So it's really good in terms of the, the speed we're looking to get as well. And it's just, just as a, a point of note for everybody as well, guys, when you're trying to improve this, um, it's very important that you have a bit of a system to it. So, like, we wouldn't really suggest that you just go take these exercises. You have a bit of a systematic program and, and, a, and a correct way of training with this. So, we're just trying to give you some guidelines and ways that you can approach it and understand it a little better. Um, but it's very important to note that, like, you wouldn't just take all these exercises as that we're doing today and just throw them in and let's go for it. You know, so it's, it's something really Adrian, that you need to kind of have a systematic approach, would you agree? Yeah, for sure. And again, it, 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 even in terms of the concept of speed training within a session, like there's no point in trying to do speed training if you're fatigued. There's no point in trying to do speed training yeah. if you're also challenged on a neurological level where you're trying to do very high accuracy movement. Like, for example, you know, you're, you're, you're in a detailed pattern session, you're holding positions for a long period of time, you know, you're trying to maintain tension in stances and so on and going from that to try and be explosive in your kicking is very very difficult so you know when you're focusing on speed you want to sequence it in the session the right way so you could do that pattern session after your speed session 
but you don't maybe want to do the pattern mm -hmm. session before your speed session. So a little bit like that is really important. Yeah. Absolutely. And then another thing that's very important to everybody as well is, is the mentality of the speed training. Like sometimes we, we spoke about here the physical side, but it's just as important as, as a mental cue as well to, to maybe have that in your mind of you want to be explosive and you, you want to maybe exert that force as quickly as possible. Uh, and then understanding what, what's required there. So it's not just a physical thing where, okay, I'm quick now. Okay, it, it, need, it needs to be coupled together with, with, the, with the correct choices and mindset. We might get into that a bit later with the, the tactical aspects and things like that. Um, but will, will we look at the, the speed endurance a little bit now, Adrian? Because I know that yeah. that's very much relevant to us as ITF sparrers because you might be able to exert the force very quickly, but can you, um, can, can you be explosive over a period of time um, to, to get some scores nice and quick and reset? Because we don't really have that time to get that full recovery. Um, so we're very much linking up our, um, our our systems here, I guess, really as well. So it's important that we can understand what we need to do. It's not just the, the one-time explosive quick speed that we're looking for here, guys, of the, the fast twitch. It's, it's a little bit more than that as well. Yeah, so I suppose the first part that we want to talk about in that is that, you know, there, there's so many components of what makes someone fast, of, of what speed is. And, you know, uh, the bit that we're looking at now kind of relates to the energy systems, which is to say, um, the, that one jump and a kick that we did there a second ago is very much in that, like uh, the creatine phosphate system. It's, it's that very readily available quick energy source that we can use immediately up to maybe five, six, seven, all the way up to maybe 11 or 12 seconds at absolute most, depending on how fit you are in that particular system. But like for most people, it should be three, four, five, six seconds, no, no problem. But the problem is that that's not what we do. We're always going to be doing more than that. We're always arriving to the ring already a little warmed up you know, or hopefully very well warmed up. We're getting in there already having used some of that. And really we're going into some blend of the, the next energy systems, the, uh, the glycolytic pathways where it's that, you know, uh, whether you're talking about the anaerobic or the aerobic energy systems. And what we re really, we want to do is make for an efficient blending of those. So we want to use our anaerobic system to get that energy quickly when we need it and then recover very quickly and clear that lactate and replenish our energy using that aerobic system. So when we go to train now, we have a very simple way of doing it. You just try to make it very much like what sparring feels like. So those fast bursts of energy with the sometimes too short recoveries over give or take a two minute period, a minute rest, and we go again. And then you get a longer break, maybe five minutes. So the ideal way of doing these kind of exercises is we have maybe six 20 second blocks between work and rest. So for example, eight seconds work, 12 seconds rest, making 20 seconds. We can do six blocks like that to make up two minutes. We rest for a full minute and then we do two more minutes, maybe with a different combination. After that, mm -hmm. you've effectively done a fight, you know? Um, it's nice every now and again where the, there's an instructor in charge to go, sorry, that was a draw, we have an extra minute, go and to do a three more rounds on top of it just to really catch you. But, you know, that's kind of where we're at. So what are we talking about? We're talking about explosive repeats. So we'll give some a very simple example of ideally these are techniques that you would be trying to use yourself in spying, a realistic combination. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, Richie, do you want to try maybe to illustrate the first one and I'll do a second one where uh, if we try the turning kick to back kick, just going... Uh, yeah. right turning kick right back kick left turning kick left back kick uh, and we'll do it in rhythm I'll track the time here so I don't kill you um, but maybe we'll do two or three rounds of it just to illustrate it and then cool. people will have some idea of how it should feel let's get stuck into that um, we'll set up the camera and the angles and stuff here are we looking okay on that side Adrian yeah yeah let's, let's see a few kicks and we'll, we'll, we'll get you going and uh, I'll, I'll make sure that we uh, I'll have the stopwatch here so we don't run you over time um, and we'll be good. Yeah, okay. yeah. So stopwatch is ready. So we're going to go eight seconds of work, 12 seconds of rest. Let's go. Rest, rest, rest. And three, two, one, go. Rest. Good stuff. And we go one more. 
Three, two, one, go. Rest, rest, rest. And that is the illustration of, like I said, I know Richie's only doing three, so I extend the last one by four or five seconds when he's fatigued. Okay, so again, we've moved from speed, pure speed. This is not the fastest that Richie can throw these combinations into speed endurance. So there's a little bit of we're losing the top end of the speed, but we're gaining the ability or we're training the ability to work at a high rate of intensity or a high intensity longer throughout a match, which is a different. So it's a, it's a solution to a different problem. So we'll swap over here and just for the sake of maybe generating some questions or thoughts, uh, we'll do a different example and uh, uh, we might try and keep track of that eight and 12 or even roughly speaking, we'll get, we'll get an idea of it and we'll have a go. So All right. for my combination, I've got Bob here. Uh, so we're going to be doing uh, a side kick, but I'm not going to hit uh, Bob, so we're going to have this position and the hook and away. So that's going to be my combination for my eight seconds. I'm going to really suffer with this one because I'm doing everything on the same leg. That's the plan. So you can give okay, me. Okay, we're good to go. Time. Yeah. Three, two, one, go. Time. It's nice to move around as well under recovery, not just stand or sit down or... And go! Time. One more. And go. Okay. And I promise you, you do your six rounds, even with just the eight seconds on, the 12 seconds off, you will feel it because the recovery yeah. becomes insufficient. And that's what it's about. And then, and, and the, the thing as well, Adrian, is I noticed there on my last one in particular, your technique starts to kind of fade away a bit. And it's not as sharp as you, you had it at the beginning. And yeah. that's kind of something that we need to train as well, of course, because you can't have everything perfect all the time because there's going to be times in the matches when you're fatigued and you have to be able to work in that condition. So it's not really, a, it's you, I would not use techniques that I'm getting familiar with and, and kind of things that I'm learning. You know, it wants be, you want it to be something you're quite familiar with that as you start to get fatigued, you can still maybe draw it together a little bit. Not something that you're learning fresh off the bat for the first time. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, certainly for us, not that it'd be brilliant at the best of times, but we've come off the back of a year of not hitting pads with a partner. So this is yeah. definitely the least prepared we are to do explosive <laughs> you know, ever. But the concept is, yeah, now that maybe we can come to the gym and hit an inanimate object, yeah, we can get started with it. But it's not the same as working with a real partner who can watch you, can you start to drop your hand you're, and, and really start to pick up on things. And mm -hmm. that really does help it. And we would try to have our explosive repeats tailored to what each individual person is actually trying to use in their sparring. So we won't set one up where the person has the mobility to do a high hook kick. So they don't do a high hook kick. They have something else that they do in their own sparring. Yeah. Because again, as you said, they're going to lose intensity if they're trying to compromise and find a way to make a technique work. So we've got to bring them back to where the technique is functional for them. They can perform it at a high intensity. And again, it's important to remember, this is like a, a Taekwondo specific way of training an energy pathway of building a particular aspect of fitness. It is not, um, you know, it's not technical practice. It's not, yeah. you know, it, it, it serves a different purpose. Now, ideally, as our capacity builds, we can maintain efficiency. You know, our technique can stay solid, our skill can stay solid under pressure. But again, all I'm doing is repeating an exercise against an inanimate object. That's not, that doesn't translate to sparring, except in the physiology. Yeah. You know, a little bit in the movement efficiency maybe, but also yeah. the physiology. 
So, mm, and, and that, that feeling you get in the muscles, that little bit of um, when, when the muscles are burning and you have to push it, that, that's a feeling that if, you, if you've been through the rounds and, and you, you know that feeling of, right, you need, you need to go, maybe you're down on the scorecards and you need to go chase and you need yeah. to be able to push that leg and, and you need to get to work. So that's very much where these things come in. You need to have that in the back pocket. So a couple of quick questions that have been jumping in there and be great to maybe have a look at now. So from Brendan, uh, Lyme discussion is leaning towards periodization uh, for sessions and having a plan or schedule. Uh, sprint or jump athletics training had you in the gym in the winter on weight, speed, work, plies in spring. 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. 100%, Brendan. Um, the, the more you want to get, you know, in, improve your quality within the various disciplines of Taekwondo, within the various uh, modes of training, the more you do need to uh, to plan and to periodize. And the very first thing you need to understand is, first of all, for anyone who's watching here, if you're not training at least three times a week, you can forget about planning or periodization. It's not really relevant yeah. to you. This you steps in. Yeah, this steps in when you go a little further. Really, all that Brendan's talking about there is it's time management first. And then secondly, it's an element of uh, managing your body as a, you know, a, as a very breakable machine that if you try to do it all, all the time, you break down. So you have to find what's going to be done at intensity and what's going to be done at a, a much lower, gentler pace at each point in time so that you don't ever like go to fifth gear on everything that you're doing and end up blowing up and having no engine left. We have to try and manage each thing in its season. And we also have to prioritize. So you might even decide for a whole year, and it's the advantage of being a black belt, you don't grade every year or anything like that. You can decide what's important to progress at a particular period of time and focus on your own goats, your own things that you want to improve. So yes, definitely, Brendan, for me anyway, that's just the way it yeah. goes. And, and of course, and of course, as well with this, it's for the, the guys who are at the higher level competing internationally. You're looking at peaking at certain times of the year. So usually you'll be trying to peak twice in a season. Um, so that's where that comes in very much so as well. Uh, so there, there is a difference and the context is very, very important here for the people who are training just to train and the people who are training to compete at a very high level. Yeah. Uh, and then a question that has a couple of different possible answers from uh, uh, Master and Mrs. Murphy. So as younger children have a lower lactate threshold, is it just a question of reducing the time and reps or is this type of training not ideal for them? And thanks. So yeah, there's a good few things. So first of all, yes, mm. the children would be less suited to that higher intensity, building their aerobic, or anaerobic threshold kind of thing. Yeah, we're, we're not really aiming to do that with the kids. So the version of this kind of training the kids will do uh, is rhythmic. So we're looking to get them to uh, improve the rhythm of the drills. Uh, it can still be, the speed stuff can still be there because maximal effort in terms of speed for one individual or a number of techniques with full rest, great for kids because they have lots of energy fatigue quickly. So that's really good for them. With this kind of thing, they can go in explosive bursts as long as they have a lot of recovery time. The issue with this is that focus on trying to maintain any kind of technique over a long period of time at high intensity is probably, even from a concentration point of view, it's difficult enough for kids. So what we will often try, unless of course you just watch those guys who, for whatever reason, have you know five-year-olds that they've been training for two years in uh, Thai boxing and spend the whole day out in the porch holding pads um, and they look really good on Instagram and YouTube. So, you know, the next, like, for 10 years, I've been watching videos of the next world champion X, Y, Z. Um, and so far, there's not that many of them who've become the next world champion because they've gone to become a doctor or an engineer or, you know, whatever happens. So really, don't start, we don't want to start thinking of our kids as top level competitors or athletes. Really, this is about how do we get them to seek enjoyment, I think, and fulfillment in the training? How do we get them to enjoy this type of training? And it's not going to be the crush them with fatigue, you know, as we train their energy system, it's really at that stage more about let's develop rhythmic challenges, let's complete sequences, let's see can we get four in a row, six in a row, eight in a row, and if they can maintain that and then we can just go, okay, let's go a little faster and you give them plenty of time to recover, let's see who can, how many, who can do, you know, the most in 20 seconds or 15 mm -hmm. seconds or whatever and let them go for that and stop and celebrate that someone got eight and someone got seven or that someone went, you know, had got all of them right, or, you know, that's the way that we'll do it with the kids. It, the, the outputs definitely aren't about improving a lactate curve. 
Yeah, I agree 100%. That's what I do with my kids as well, that idea of maybe how, how many can you do in X amount of seconds and have it as a little challenge between themselves. With their, they're pushing themselves, trying to challenge between each other. It's fun, it's engaging, it, and, but at the same time, they're getting to, to build a little bit of foundation on these qualities as well. And, and this is one of the things where, like, when we go back to our coaching point of view, we're going to see the kids are improving at different rates. Adults too, everybody's going to improve at different rates. So you might find it, look, particularly when you're working with a broad ability group, like, a, you know, you're not working with national team hopefuls, you're working with, you know, just your, your group of yellow and green belts. And they're going to be at different uh, levels. And what you will often do is, well, I don't want to change this to, say, going from, from an 8 and 12 second split, you know, to a harder 9, 11 second split for everybody, because there's a lot of people who are still just not getting the techniques right. But you might just tweak it and have one person only go on their left side or, you know, they might have a slightly more challenging kick or they might have to go uh, with a change of legs in between each one to challenge their coordination and their like their balance. So play with it a lot more. Um, and, and definitely at the early stages, don't worry about, uh, uh, you know, really dialing in on what energy system you're hitting, etc. They'll just, uh, you know, they, they, I think it's a good time now to talk about the other components of speed because we've been talking about it in terms of how yeah. do we build speed? Let's talk about some of the other things that really contribute to speed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we, we've touched on this too, and I put it on um, our swipe ups there today on our story on Facebook and Instagram, the video that we touched on pre previously, um, where, where Adrian really highlighted the, the tactical implications of it in terms of are you at the correct distance? So trying to exert maximum amount of force when you're at incorrect distance and you're, you're out of range. It those boxes there being the correct range, selecting the correct technique and things like that. It gives you a much better chance to get off a technique with good speed and good force um, compared to if you just focus on the physical alone. And of course, then at, at the higher end of this stuff as well, which we probably we haven't spoken about today, but you do need a certain amount of strength to get off your um, force production. So like that's not something that you're going to be looking at with your with your yellow and green belt kids in your class, for example. It, it's it's the context here is very much very very important. Um, we, you need that foundation. It's, it's like trying to launch a, a cannon from a canoe that's a, on a river. You know, it's not going to it's not going to happen. You need to have that solid structure, and, and yeah. it's the same thing applies here. You, you need that that strength foundation, which is very important. And, and like that's not something you're going to be looking at with these younger kids. So. We, we do encourage people to kind of like to look at this from a, a context perspective as well, which is quite important. But coming back to um, some of the details there that we have, which are non-physical, you definitely have those implications like the position of the ring, the distance between you and the opponent, the, the correct choice of a technique, and all these things will contribute to if you can get a, a technique from A to B quite quickly, obviously, which are, which are a lot of times there are things that we take for granted when we're thinking about speed. Yeah, definitely. And, and we also have to consider that we are genuinely almost always hitting a moving target. So all of the practice that I did today anyway was with Bob and Bob here isn't getting out of my way. So when I land and I explode, I'm hitting to that one spot, which is wonderful. But now what if Bob is drifting? Bob is moving away from me as I do that. Bob is punching me in the face as I'm trying to, to do that. The kind of speed that's relevant has an awful lot more to do with the correct time and place under pressure. And so that's where you might see someone who is pad fast, you know, so they can rep out really, really explosive stuff on the pads, but they're beaten to the punch in the ring. And it's because they're, they're, they're having to get to that point. So the point where I'm hitting Bob again here, like I'm close enough to be punched here as I'm kicking Bob with the back leg. So no matter how fast I am from here, Bob can straighten his front hand and catch me. So the application of the right technique in the right place is absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't got that, no amount of explosive fast switch muscle fibers, you know, applied with 100% coordination are going to get us a score. And in the end, our game is about the scoring points and they're not getting scored on. And so the, the speed has to be applied, you know, in that context. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about it as well, like, speed also applies when we're trying to catch someone for three points you know so if you're not flexible enough you have to compromise an awful lot of things which takes away from your speed so your form has to be conducive to your speed your technique has to be efficient enough to let you move quickly so if you have to do a step with your back foot before you attack with that high turning kick 
well, it has to be very fast and efficient and hidden within your movement. Otherwise, that's just a giveaway and the person leans back a little bit and they don't get hit. So the, the technique component of speed is really important as well. Yeah, and, and just building on that a little bit as well, Adrian, is the whole idea of like genetics. When you, when you mention people who are, are very flexible, think of somebody who's hyper -flex, hypermobile, excuse me, for example. Um, a lot of times it's going to be hard for them to exert a lot of force. Um, so like uh, genetically as well, it comes down to these things of, of, of playing to your strengths. Um, so like there's ways around just the physical opponent of maybe you being able to get from A to B quite quickly and being clever about it. So it's very, very important that you look at it from that perspective, like Adrian just gave the example of as well. Yeah. And then let's, um, let's maybe talk about the training of it. So when we're training any component, so if we want to build strength, we have to stress the body by adding more load, uh, either more load per, per repetition or more repetitions at a given weight or more sets of a given number of repetitions. So when we're training speed, there's kind of a, a very important concept, which is, you know, we, we want to be fully recovered in order to train speed efficiently, like, efficiently. So that maximum speed, we can't do it from a state of fatigue. So it means that the number of repetitions is very small by comparison. And that's really kind of counterintuitive. So if we took this to its extreme, and we talk about breaking a board or jumping to hit a high front kick, we'll say, and take it away from sparring. We go into special technique of power breaking. Well, our maximum explosive might be one to three reps in a session that we build towards with some lower intensity reps and so on. But our maximum effort might only happen, as I said, one to three times in a session. So that's when you go for your three or four board sidekick break. That might only happen once in a session. But you might have a number of them that are lower intensity where it's a one board break for accuracy and you repeat it, you know, that kind of thing. So we have, there, there's a, if you haven't uh, come across it, look up Prilipin's chart uh, or Prilipin's chart. Uh, it gives you a good kind of idea of the trade-off between volume and intensity. So as you increase the number of uh, repetitions, it all drops off. So it'll give you an idea of kind of based on a percentage of your maximum effort, how many repetitions you might have and in how many sets. So it's a good place to start, I think, uh, in mm. terms of looking at how we do this. Um, but just in, in the, the practical context as well, Adrian, it's like, think, think of it in like the gym, a one rep max. When you're going yeah. to hit a one rep max, you don't go in there and do it a few multiple times. You build up to it and you can only, you can only exert that amount. It's the same, the most, the most explosive sport in the world is probably the 100 meter sprint people would argue, but more than likely, you say Bolt isn't going to go up there and do 100 meter after 100 meter after 100 meter. It builds up to that, gives it one absolute recover from that. Oh, absolutely. And it's not like he runs sub 10 seconds every training session either. You know, it's a yeah. case of, you know, he might run accelerators, he might run, he, he'll do some technique drills, he might have a session where in an hour and a half he runs 300 meter runs, you know, at, at a particular pace or you know whatever it happens to be yeah it's different i mean you, you look at a, an olympic lifter with the snatch like again talk about an explosive movement it's over in less than a second event done but the amount of work that's done in moving that weight that short distance is like is it, incredible so for us in terms of what we do if we look at it as a lifetime thing first we want to work in our technique and the consistency of our technique before we add the intensity and i mean i think that's the really important part of like if we haven't got a decent technique by adding intensity and load on that technique, it breaks down even more and we end up, you know, making a mess of it. So we have to be, you know, it's the smooth is fast, fast is smooth kind of thing. Like the, the cleaner our mm. technique is, the easier it's going to be do, to do it repeated under increased stress of intensity of time pressure, whatever it happens to be. So the, uh, that would be the one. I'll, I'll actually just pop that out for uh, uh, Frank and Katarina uh, there as well. They were just asking about the chart. So, um, Okay. I, I'll write it in. Yeah, so this might be a good time for anybody else, guys, who has questions and get them in now because we'll be finishing up. So if you have any questions on anything we covered today or anything on the topic, maybe get your questions in now. And um, so for anybody else who's been following along on Fridays, we, we've had some guests on the show on Fight Chat Friday for the last few weeks. So we're aiming to have another guest on this Friday again to maybe talk through their highlights and their their career as an ITF competitor. So stay tuned for that if you haven't done so already. Um, so they've been fantastic so far. We, we've had Adam Shelley, multiple world champion. We've had Han Louis and Julia Cross. So 
Uh, we, we're expecting to have some more great guests lined up in the future, so stay tuned to that and subscribe to the channel if you're new and you're interested in those shows. Super. Yeah, really looking forward to that, and hopefully we, uh, everything gets lined up properly for Friday and we can just bang on with that one. Should be good. Fantastic. So is that all the questions we have, Adrian, yeah? That's it for now. Fantastic. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you did enjoy the, the episode, please hit that like button, the thumbs up on YouTube. And make sure and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thanks for tuning in. Great to have you here as always. And we'll see you in the next one. See you Friday.